Good afternoon. My name is Mary Ann James, and I'm the Associate Superintendent for the County Office of Education, and I'd like to welcome all of you here to the 21st Annual High School Poetry Competition. Uh, my boss, Michael Watkins, the County Superintendent of Schools, is very sorry that he can't be here. He's actually driving just about as fast as he can from Sacramento to get here, so we might see him flying in the back door. But what he wants to make sure that I uh, relate to all of you is his gratitude to Poetry Santa Cruz, to the teachers of Santa Cruz County, especially English teachers, particularly this evening, and um, especially the students. Uh, in the field that I work in with K-12 schools and K-12 educators, uh, we focus a lot on those 21st century skills, collaboration, creativity, critical thinking, and communication, and clearly the students that are here tonight show all of those skills. We're thrilled with their creativity and the words that they have to say, and I, I just get tickled every time I get an opportunity to hear students uh, speak their voice, and as adults, our job is to listen very carefully. So the other job that I get to do tonight on behalf of Michael is to uh, say thank you to a number of our teachers in the county who worked with students. And it says specifically gratitude to teachers who taught or and or encouraged the submission of poems to this competition. So these are either your poetry teachers, your English teachers, your mentors, your collaborators, sometimes your inspirations, but always your heroes. So I'm going to name them, Ms. Joanne Brown, Mr. Peter Douche, Ms. Karen Frazier, Ms. Therese Johannesson, Ms. Arlene Sandy, and all of them teach at the Alternative Family Education. Ms. Melissa Silver and Ms. Danielle Zaragoza at Aptos High School. And I should apologize ahead of time if I mess up their names. Ms. Margie Illip from the ARC Independent Studies, Dr. Caballero Robb at Georgiana Bruce Kirby Prep School, Ms. Margot Kipps, Ms. Marina Martin, and Ms. Rogers at Harbor High School. Ms. Amy Deming and Pastor Danielle Gregory at Monterey Bay Academy. Mr. Laramie Hosqual, Mrs. Rigby, and Mr. Marcus Swagger at Monta Vista Christian School. I'm sorry about the names. <laughs> Ms. Melissa Sanders Self at Mount Madonna School. Mr. James Lucas at Pajaro Valley High School. Ms. Tiffany Darrow at San Lorenzo Valley High School. Ms. Catherine Frankie at Santa Cruz High School, Ms. Ann Brooke Freeman and Ms. Anita Long at Scotts Valley High School, Ms. Candu, Ms. Dawson, Ms. Robin Miranda, and Ms. Di Diane O'Reilly at Soquel High School, Ms. Jennifer Isant and Ms. Elizabeth Shaw at Star Community School, Mr. Dennis Martin and the teachers for the classes where he gives poetry writing workshops, Ms. Bonnie Dankert at Robin A. Hartman School, Ms. Jen Isant Gonzalez at Natural Bridges School, Ms. Jessica Vargas at Yes School, Ms. Stephanie Spungen at the Camp Recovery Center, and Ms. Laura Holm at Star Academy. Many of them are here this evening. I'd like to give them a round of applause. Please join me. <laughs> and now it is my pleasure to introduce Dennis Morton, who will introduce the students and facilitate their reading tonight. Thank you. First, I, I want to thank all of you for being here. It means a lot to the uh, participants to, uh, to see that people care. And uh, so thank you all for being here in attendance. And thanks for all of the, uh, to all of the teachers. And uh, Tom McCoy and Len Anderson uh, have basically created uh, this evening. And there is Tom right there. And there is Len Anderson. Len put all of these notes together and uh, I want to apologize uh, ahead of time for any mispronunciations. Any, many, I'll say many mispronunciations that I am guaranteed to make during the evening. Um, I have to say that I don't know whether Michael will show up or not, but Michael Watkins is uh, an amazing friend of the arts. I, I, I don't know uh, a school administrator who has who understands how important the arts are to children uh, 
like Michael. He, he's truly, truly amazing. And I want to give a big round of applause to Michael Watson. Okay, so let's see what Len has got here for me to say first. Oh, yeah. I want to thank the judges. Is Susan Freeman here? There are three judges for the, the uh, poems that are in this wonderful anthology. Susan, you are not here, but thank you. Is uh, Patricia Zalius here? There she is. Would you stand up? She's not just a good judge of poetry, but she's a very fine poet. And Andrew Fagg, I know you are here. Where are you? Have I mispronounced your name, Andrew? Fagg. Andrew Fagg. So what's really cool is that our three judges have no idea who wrote the poems. They have a stack of, uh, I think there were 360 poems submitted this year. And they have to go through each one. They have no idea who wrote them. And uh, collectively, they narrow it down to uh, 50, 51 poems, which end up in this anthology. And uh, then they have to do the delicate task of, of uh, saying, OK, I think maybe this one deserves a, uh, an honorable mention or a, one of the first three prizes, etc. And it's grueling work. I did it once myself, and I know how hard and difficult it is. But uh, thank you very much to the judges. Uh, all right, let's see. What do I have to say here now? Well, have I thanked the poets? I am thanking all of the poets. Uh, without the poets, no poem, no, uh, no, no gig here tonight, OK? Um, the, the most important part of this is that students learn to connect with that thing that's deep inside all of us, this creative, little creative zone that uh, you, could, you could go most of your life without having it opened up and if, uh, if the circumstances aren't right. And uh, the teachers and uh, Michael Watkins have been instrumental in helping to open up this creative spark that is in all of us. And, uh, that's the most important thing, not, not even that your poem gets into the uh, anthology. Um, all right. We've got all kinds of information on the table somewhere in the back about how you can get more deeply involved in the local poetry community, if you'd like. Poetry Santa Cruz is the uh, kind of the official uh, um, sponsor of this uh, event, uh, uh, aside from the uh, County Office of Education. And uh, you can find out how to get involved in, uh, in our events. We have monthly readings, usually at Bookshop Santa Cruz on the second Tuesday. And we have uh, once a month in the main library in Santa Cruz, there's an open reading. There's a featured reader and then an opportunity for all of you to read your poems. And there is the Flory Canto reading at uh, Cabrillo every year. And, 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 and. Okay, I've thanked Michael. Have I thanked Marianne James, who introduced me? Thank you, Marianne, wherever you are. There she is. Okay. And Melanie Martin. I don't know if Melanie is here, but uh, Melanie is uh, an assistant to uh, Michael, and you know how that goes uh, about the work of 20 people gets done by special assistants like that. One person does the work of 20. All right, uh, alternative ed uh, classroom teachers, thank you very, very, very much. I work in four, uh, I lead poetry workshops myself in four of these alternative ed classrooms, and they're wonderful, they're amazing. You know, they're like, they're like one, room schoolhouses and uh, the, a special camaraderie, camaraderie grows up among the, the students and uh, the teachers. I um, want to thank members, donors, and supporters of Poetry Santa Cruz. I've thanked our judges, project assistants from Barbara Bloom, Elka Maus, Ellen McCarthy, and uh, Joni Morrow. The anthology title comes from the poem, The Cherry Tree, by Evan Bauer. 
And uh, Evan Bauer is here tonight, I hope. There, Evan Bauer. All right. Okie dokie. Front cover art. Um, the anthology is a black and white reproduction of the pen and ink drawing, A Gift by Melissa. Melissa, are you here? No. C H A R G I N. Chargin. Chargin. No, she's here. Chargin, okay. Melissa Chargin. Her piece of art. Where am I? Back cover, Tuesday morning. And are you here, Renee Buendia? There she is. All right, stand up. Stand up. That's really gorgeous. Now, this is a photograph of Oh my God, my memory is failing me. Jo yes, yes. Ms. O'Keefe, the great uh, artist. And uh, this is here because it, uh, it's what inspired the, I think, the uh, first place poem. So when you get a chance, take a look at these. And now we're almost to the poems. Well, I want to thank the Santa Cruz Art League because they have, uh, this is, the, I think, the 59th year that they have um, uh, put on the uh, annual high school art show. And Doreen Davis of the Art League uh, has helped uh, with this. And now for the reading. Yes, okay. We're ready. So we're going to start with the honorable mention poems. Then we will uh, go to the uh, uh, prize winners, the three prize winners, third, second, and first. And uh, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now, this is really handy because Len has put a check mark here so that I know who is actually here. Evan Bauer is here. Will you come up, uh, Evan, and read your poem? Sure. All right. I guess so. No, read them both. All right. Oh, read them both. <laughs> All right. I heard the voice of the man. <laughs> uh, this is titled, He Was Only Four. <laughs> Miles lies on the cold floor, paws off to one side, chestnut fur no longer shimmering, eyes filled with submission, and a primordial understanding of what is to pass. I don't want to understand. How dare you reach down with your greedy, grubby mitts to steal my loving companion. Heaven must be in dire shape to recruit such souls. But it wasn't enough to just grab him, was it? You had to test him, to ravage his body, to see if his spirit stayed true. Well, it did, for six torturous months. If this is how you run admissions, don't bother sending me an invite. <laughs> And this Can you is hear back there? No. 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 So. No. Oh, no. Um, Can you hear that? <laughs> Let's move this up. Right, Kim? Test it. See if Can you hear me now? Yeah. All right. This is titled The Cherry Tree. I believe the cherry tree stays beautiful year round. The intense allure, the rapture of the blossoms, may appear to wholly subside after spring. But. The tree remains alive, subtly beautiful. Bare, slender branches intertwine like lovers' hands, embracing against winter's ice. And blossoms of euphoric passion always promise to adorn its branches next spring. But I'm only 18, 
What do I know of love's turbulent cycle? For me, it's still June. Thank you. Okay, how is this? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, Mr. Jagger. Okay. <laughs> Jagger, Mr. Jagger. I've heard that name, Jagger. Say, I, I want you to know that the, uh, the title of the anthology comes from uh, Evan's poem, What Do I Know of Love's Turbulent Cycle? So another round there. Okay, so next up, uh, actually, Len, you didn't tell me whether uh, I ought to read in the absence of the poets who are not here, whether I should read their poems. No? Uh, well, if, if there's someone who wants to read for a poet who is not here. Yes, is that... Uh, Amber Callison, who received an honorable mention for her poem, Winter, apparently is not here because there's not a check mark. You're not here, are you? <laughs> All right, we'll keep on going. Yejun Hong. All right. for putting egg yolk under your pillow. I know it smells bad and is sticky, but I had fun. <laughs> I didn't have time to turn the page. <laughs> My God. All right. So, C.C. Marino, uh, is also uh, an honorable mention for her poem, The Look, but she apparently is not here. But you may, you may read her poem in the anthology. Tobias Miller, honorable mention for his poem, Swell, and it's on page 16 if you have uh, the anthology with you. Sweet, thank you guys for coming and uh, watching me perform. Um, my poem is Swell. Here we go. Big, cold and mean, peeking and unsure, drops in, whistling, far and close, and Eli and Tristan compiling over the face. Philip in the wind, revulsion. When in the tube, it's quiet. Old locals whistle, far and we, and Nemo and Drew come from paddling. From skating and waiting, it's winter. The great swell hits like jaw, long and milky. Thank you, sir. All right, continuing on with our honorable mentions. Daniel Peterson, honorable mention for his poem, The Master, and it's on page 17. Nestled between two trees on the lovely lithic coast of Long Island stands a house made of wood. Paint cans, cigarettes, wine glasses, canvas, smoke, spit, passion live in the home. The master contemplates his tools, colors, the entropy of the room. A cigarette burns carelessly in the corner of his mouth while Johnny Cash laments. Methodically, he throws red paint over the naked canvas this home contains a chaos illuminated by bleached white lights that pummel the darkness of night and offer solitude to the master. Out of a red and white straw, he sprays blue paint over the red snakes on the canvas, perpetuating the frenzy. 
A red balloon filled with yellow paint is tacked to the canvas, waiting for the impending pop. The white lights cast delirious shadows that dance with every shake of the body or gust of frosty New York air. He takes one final drag right before the filter before extinguishing it in the middle of the canvas. All right, and the final of the honorable mentions is Jennifer Paolini uh, for her poem, Bobby, and oh, and Soap, she has two, on page 18 and 51, and she's a student at San Lorenzo Valley High, and Mrs. Darrow is her teacher. Ooh. Okay. Thank you. Is this good? Okay. Bobby, this was inspired by one of the students in my elementary class that I am a TA for. Bobby, you stared in my eyes like Roald Dahl said you ought to, to make sure I wasn't a witch. You believed in the fairy tales that they all taught you. You don't seem to care that the other kids don't talk to you. You like to read a lot, don't you? You tune out the world and dive into a book. You ask to sit alone because you scare the other kids. You talk to yourself, and you like to lie on the floor. The substitute had told the story of his brother, who was born with only one eye. His brother got teased, and he felt like an outcast. His bullies were very mean. When the substitute asked the class what to do about the bullies, all of the kids said the same exact thing. Stand up to the bullies. Tell an adult. But you, in the corner, for the first time in a long time, were compelled to raise your hand and give a creative answer. Your brother could get himself a glass eye. If he wasn't missing an eye, he could fit in. The sub said, good answer. And I smiled. The sub and I locked eyes. And then I looked at you. I wonder if you feel like you're missing an eye, Bobby. I assure you, you are the best in the class, the one I would save if we were all drowning. You are more than anyone gives you credit for. And this is my second um, poem. It's titled Soap. It's amazing how one sentence, so insignificant, can stick with you for years. Ten years ago, my close friend told me that when you shower, you should wash yourself with soap first. And now, 10 years later, here I am, having just gotten into the stream of water, reaching for the soap. I wonder if a statement so trivial has stayed with me after all this time in the back of my brain, what else has? Do I still hear every time he said he loved me, echoing through my mind's crevices, shouting at me, he doesn't anymore, not anymore? Or what about every time someone called me stupid or said that my shirt was hideous, or told me that I couldn't play because I was too good at watching. <coughs> Are those remarks still back there, <coughs> gnawing at the ends of my brain, telling me that I'm not good enough, that the music I listen to isn't hip enough, that the movies I watch are dumb and a waste of my time? I know that they are there in my subconscious, because every night I step into the shower, I reach for the soap bar without even meaning to. Alrighty. Now we are going to hear the prize winners, the uh, third, second, and first prize winner. Our third prize winner uh, is Emma Luke, and her poem is entitled Magnificence, and it's on page 11. She's a student at Harbor High School, and Ms. Julie Rogers is her teacher. She will actually get some moolah for this. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Magnificence. My favorite flower is a rose. But how do you tell a rose of its beauty, red like blood, thorns like swords, when she wilts and tells you that she's not as tall as a sunflower? How do you show the waves their grace, their swell like a pulse, their curl a dance, when they throw themselves at the rocky shores, 
screaming, but they're not light like the clouds. How do you tell the mountain of her power? Her cliffs proud like a queen, her edges sharp to rule, when instead she cowers and reminds herself that she'll never be soft like the stream. How do you show the rain her lullaby, her thumping beats, her gentle care, when all she hears in herself is that she's never as soft as the snow? How can you see your magnificence, your beauty, your grace, your power, when all you look for in yourself is what you see in others? All right. Now, our second prize winner is Phoebe Delot. D L O T T Delot. Oh yeah. All right. Oh cool. Uh, and her poem is unraveled. She's going to get fifty bucks. <laughs> and it's on page ten. Unraveled. She is the book that never gets read, the drawer that never gets opened, the painting that never gets hung, the snow that never melts, the leaves that never turn, the fruit that never ripens, never falls. How can you close a door that's already shut or open a heart when it has a mind of its own? A fern, if left alone, will unfurl. A single loose thread, when tugged, unravels. Would, would I be mistaken in assuming that your grandmother is, is Diana, Hartog? Diana Hartog? Diana Hartog is an absolutely wonderful poet and uh, like grandmother, like granddaughter. <laughs> uh, do you write? Uh, A little? Oh, you do, huh? Okay. All right. Now, we have come to our first prize winner, and uh, her poem is Georgia O'Keeffe Abiqui? Abiqui. Whoa. All right. Georgia O'Keeffe, Abiquiu, New Mexico, 1948. There is a photograph of Georgia O'Keeffe. She's at Mount Madonna School. Ms. Mrs. Uh, Sanders' self is her teacher. And uh, Julia is going to get a uh, hundred bucks. <laughs> and uh, her poem is on page eight. Georgia O'Keeffe, Abiquiu, New Mexico, 1948. Photographed by Philippe Halsman. Can you hear? I'm having a hard time right here. Sorry. <laughs> she sits on the cracked and crumbling paving stone under the overcast and brilliantly white New Mexico sky. She sits with what remains of a noble being, the bison that roamed the Great Plains as she does the desert painting what she sees and feels. She wears a black hat and coat and a white shirt and headscarf. Strange for a woman so known for her colors. Crimson, vermilion, indigo, ivory white, and the breezes are filled with coyote bush and white sage. Her eyes seeing the world full of beauty in its decay. Her wrinkles convey her age as if all she saw and painted slowly became a part of her. The mountains and valleys, the land carved out by rivers for thousands of years. You can feel it in the land. It is old, ancient, yet its vibrancy comes from its death. Oh, look at this. The moolah is about to be. Oh, boy.
Okay, now at this point, the, uh, the poets you will hear will appear alphabetically by last name. And the, uh, the first poet that we will, oh, no check mark. Pedro Aguirre is not here. No, he's not here. Right. Is there someone who wants to read his poem? All right. Now, oh, okay. Here's a poem. I, I'm quite familiar with this. This is a poem by Anonymous. And the reason for that is that this was written by a student at Juvenile Hall, and his name must remain anonymous, but I will read it for him as I was the person present and when he wrote it. Uh, let's see. Where is it? Got a scrape. Got a scrape. Oh, I've got it. Okay, yeah, I'll just read it out of here. That's a good idea. Yeah, that, uh, they're, they're all in here. What the heck? God, all right. Here. All right. The name of the poem is Gotta Scrape. No food at my place. No food on the plate. Pop's been away. Mom's got a scrape. The water's been cold, bills can't get paid, debts stacking up, only thing growing is hate, but I'll never be ashamed, only fifteen when I became a man, learned the dope game, tried to get what I could, out on the streets I wasn't playing Pac-Man, praying for better days with a rosary in my hand. Everyone's story is the same on my turf. We all like brothers. Mom's always at work. We're picking change from the dirt, saying R.I.P. to friends in the church. All right, now on page 30, you will find a poem entitled To God, and Miranda Beasley is the poet, and uh, page Miss... Page 22. Page, it says, okay, uh, all right, it's on page what? 22. 22, all right. Like I was saying, it's on page 22. Miranda Beasley, are you here? There you are. God. We apologize for the inconvenience, but it appears that there's no poem on this page. There could be a poem somewhere here. You can imagine a poem, if that gives your life more meaning. You can write a whole book on the poem that may or may not be here. You can worship it, live for the magnificence that is this poem. But whatever you do, please, do not force the idea of this poem upon others, because you do not know if there is actually a poem here. Have your opinion. We have ours. And in our humble opinion, there is no poem on this page. Thank you. Have a nice day. <laughs> I, I, there's no poem on this page. <laughs> I, I neglected to say that uh, the um, the anonymous poet uh, Bonnie Dankert is uh, the classroom teacher at uh, Hartman School. So, thanks to Bonnie Dankert. All right, now we're going to uh, no Rhiannon Bloss is not here. Adriana Brock is not here, and if there is someone who knows these poets and would like to read the poem, please do speak up. Yes, come on up. One poem by each Brock. Two Brocks. Yeah. Okay. And you are? Um, I'm Maria Elena Cavallero. And I'm an English teacher at Kirby. Yeah. Um, thank you. 
I can't take credit for these beautiful poems. Um, I will read By the Numbers on page 25 by Adriana Brock. By the Numbers. She told me as we studied for calculus, her fingers tapping the hardwood kitchen table while I ate marshmallows out of the bag. She was wearing pink. I know because I remember how her skin tone looks with pink like a flower on soil, dusted, disconnected, dry. 50, she said, for two marshmallows. It's hard to forget, she said. 185, one slice of bread. 17, three pieces of apple. And the math she was doing was foreign to me, devoid of integrals and absolute sums. I'd known girls like her, known in the sense that I had touched them, held them, picked up the phone, I'd taken them to teachers and therapists, sat with them, promised they would be okay, and some of them were. I couldn't imagine what it would be like to live that way, broken sighted, to always be looking, looking again in the mirror, stepping again on the scale, stepping, looking again, again, hungry, hungry, so hungry, but afraid to eat. People ask, would you rather die a slow, painful death or watch someone you loved die the same way? I say, I would prefer either to waking up one day, finding that someone dead or dying, breaths away, and knowing I missed the signs. I should have seen, should have thought, should have asked. But she's sick and I didn't even see her cough. When I told my therapist about my friend, she asked me to let her know when my friend got out of the hospital. I said, she's not in the hospital. I know, she said, not yet. Um, on page 29, uh, A Drunken Stargaze is a poem by another Kirby student called Eleanor Brock. A drunken stargaze. I am the shards on the sidewalk, the glittering glass, broken pieces of coke and beer bottles that whisper under the street lights, the stars of the black city in the middle of the night. I hope I was shaken hard, that I bubbled before the lovers stumbled, spewing rolls of sweet drunken laughter held shaky hands and slammed me against their fathers who disapprove against the coarse concrete, crushed me under their converse all-star sneakers, ripping another hole in their denim hams. I come after the clattering of tin tops and the jingling of keys. Pocket knives that they gave you at Boy Scout camp are used now in a dark alley behind the gym to lever me and open what you stole from the back of the fridge. I was forged from hot air, breath, and fire in a big brick room in Minnesota, where they strung me out, blew and curved me into myself. Now I am left in the cracks to cut the toes of foolish wanderers. Uh, oh, didn't uh, didn't she have two poems? Yeah, but I didn't. I don't want to read both. All right. Okay. Okay. All right. Molly Brown, uh, whose teacher is Ms. Rogers at Harbor High School, has a poem on page thirty called "Determination," but I don't see a check, so I don't know if Molly is here. Anyone who knows Molly and would like to read her poem? All right. We then go to Matthew Campbell. No check mark on Matthew. I happen to know Matthew. He's a student of Jessica Vargas, and uh, I worked with Matthew. I will read his poem. It's called Who, and it is on page 32. Sorry, I forgot to bring this up. 
a basket full of grief, a bowl filled with sorrow. I'm a slave to depression. Who lives at the bottom of these scars? I can indeed. Emma Burns, ARC Independent, uh, are you here? Oh, okay. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Uh, my poem was called My Generation, and uh, does anybody ever think to think about these ridiculous decisions about our hashtag blacked out, jacked up society's system? We're all so caught up with our Instagrams and our likes, no one confronting problems because we have Facebook fights. You don't even have to leave your room because you got 15 likes on the picture of your food. So keep on bragging about your followers and all the likes, just tell me how that'll help you amount to anything in life. <laughs> I'm sorry that I skipped you there. I didn't intend to. All right, the uh, next poet uh, apparently is also not here. Noah Chambers, stress on page 33. Is uh, Noah here? All right, then uh, moving on, Douglas Chambliss, a student of Miss Darrow at San Lorenzo High School. His poem is entitled <laughs> Unicode Unison, and it's on page 34. Douglas? Ah, there you are, sir. <laughs> Hello? Good? Mm. Left or right? This is good. All right. <laughs> okay. This is called Unicode Unison. How long can you bear flirting with the apathetic letters in front of you? Personal connection and closeness, measured by message count, dictated by character limit. No good morning and no good night create two faraway strangers. Smiley face and winky face and kissy face, 20 by 20 JPEG resolution. Give you jittery moss in the brain. Two screens between two lovers don't bridge the distance, don't keep you together, but pull the cold metallic curtain. How long can you bear the, synth the synthetic heart that tells you that you feel when you don't? Okay. Nice job. Kara Claney on page 35 has a poem, My Reflection. Ms. Rogers is her teacher at Harbor High, but I don't see a check mark. Kara, are you here? Is anyone here who would like to read her poem? All right. Next up is Gianna Diaz, a student of Ms. Amy Deming at Monterey Bay Academy. Her poem is called The Fog, and it's on page 36. Gianna, you are here somewhere? Ah, uh, there you are. <laughs> the Fog, walking down the class, the blurs of students, hidden in the gray clouds. No light is here. The sun is non-existent. One person in particular stands out. Dressed to impress, as I walk more, I noted it is a he coming towards me. He is in a suit, bow tie and shiny shoes. His face is something different, eyes meet mine. I simply smile, walk past him, leaving, with, leaving him with the mystery of me. <laughs> <laughs> Th 
Thank you. All right. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Alexandra Farr, I believe, is not here. Her poem is Fix It on page 37. Anyone care to read Alexandra Farr's poem in her place? <laughs> Moving on to uh, Dennis? Tom. Joni. All right, Joni, come on up. Joni, Joni is one of the uh, organizers of this event. Let's give her a hand for that. I apologize for, can everyone hear me? Yeah. I apologize for Alexandra if she didn't want this read, but um, from someone that knows exactly what she's talking about, sometimes you need someone else to, um, to do it for you because you can't do it for yourself. So I want to do that for her. Um, it's called Fix It. Your bony fingers grasp at my skin pulling and pulling until nothing is left. They reach down my throat and rid me of my dreams and hopes and dress sizes. Your muscleless hands run down my sides, down my hips, my thighs, my insecurities. You promised to make me confident, but all I want is to turn to the side and disappear. You taunt me with things I can do nothing about and force me to believe that I can. My legs are too thick. Stop eating. Your bony arm doesn't reach all the way around my already too small waist. Stop eating. Your voice screams at me from the TV speakers and the centerfolds of magazines. We don't carry your size. Embrace your curves as long as your middle finger can fit inside the dress your mom gave you when you were six. You were so pretty back then. No one can love you until you love yourself, they say. I look in the mirror, wishing I could transport myself to the other side. Do I love myself there? Counting calories, counting pills, counting stretch marks. Your nose is too big, you can fix it. Your collarbones aren't showing, you can fix it. Your hip bones are hidden, you can fix it. Your fingers don't fit around your arm, you can fix it. Stuck in a cycle must recover, can't recover. I am too fat to have a problem, right? Right. As my clothes start to fall off, people stare. It must, it must be the last 10 pounds your unforgiving words have not ripped from my body. You starve your inner child, her big blue eyes turning black. If she knew who she was to become, she would never have opened them. Bigger, smaller, bigger, smaller, smallest, perfect. Never perfect. But you will finally be beautiful. My rose-colored skeleton is hanging in your closet, wearing that sweater that is just a little too small. Wow, that was amazing, a, a poem in praise of the so-called uh, imperfect, wonderful. Ah, uh, where are we? Amanda, favorite, are you here? It does not indicate that you are. Is there anyone who would like to read Amanda's poem? She is a student of Mrs. Miranda at Soquel High, and her, page, her poem is on page 40. All right, the next uh, poet up is Leif Frazier, a student at Laura, of Laura Brown at the Alternative Family Education. His poem is 
Hope of India, Hope of the World. It's on page 41. Come on up, please. There once was just one man who stopped to injustice on a train in South Africa. There once was just one man who dared to live by his principles. He calmly looked into the eyes of those who would suppress him. So they beat him, so they imprisoned him. And he calmly looked into those eyes while he took his liberties, while he walked for freedom. He knew he would have no less than freedom. Miles he walked and invited his fellow Indians. He invited the poor, he invited the rich, he invited the Hindus, he invited the Muslims. He invited anyone who dared walk with him. He invited his people, his India, over and over, without question, without prejudice, to take a peaceful stand, to dare dream of freedom over and over. To not bend his principles, to not be sold out, bought out, corrupted, to be the undaunted example of what we all dream each one of us can be. India comes home to govern her own pure, simple freedom. Mahatma Gandhi. Thank you very much, Leif. Uh, Taylor Gabori, are you here? I was pretty sure she wouldn't be. Uh, Taylor is from the Yes School, and I, I work with uh, Taylor. I'm going to read her poem in her absence. It's called, Call Me Coffee. They call me coffee, because I grind so fine. They call me coffee, because I'll keep you up at night. They call me coffee, because I'm really bitter. And most people can't take me straight. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> you know something? I'm, what, I must have skipped. No, I didn't. Okay. Lexi Julian, are you here? All right, come on up. Lexi Julian is a student of Miss... Sanders Self at Mount Madonna School, and she has two poems, Lucky and Overload, and they're at page 44 and 45. Let's, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, is, let's get her is down. Is this a good? Bit. I'm short, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I gotta see which way to. Okay, it's all good. <laughs> Give it a try. Hello. Closer. Higher. Hello. Wait. You can't make me shorter than I already am. All right, give it a shot. Is this good? Yeah. Okay. Um, my first poem is called Lucky. They said she was lucky like a four-leaf clover because she knew how to talk the talk and seemed to walk the walk. But they didn't realize a chain is only as strong as its weakest link that she was far from a diamond in the rough, but rather a drop in the bucket with a fate worse than death. Her Achilles heel, that beauty is in the eye of the beholder, when her eyes were as blind as a bat's. Her silence spoke volumes, if anyone would have stopped, looked, and listened. But no one reads between the lines when something is picture perfect, even though everyone says beauty is only skin deep. And so she was an army of one, walked in an uphill battle with the demons inside. Her bridges were burned, leaving her caught between a rock and a hard place. She was ready to rest her weary bones. The fight had gone out of her eyes. In this quiet before the storm, one could see the devil in the details. For eyes are windows to the soul. But out of sight, out of mind, realization came too late when already she was going, going, gone. Okay. And then I have a second poem called Overload. And it's a prose poem. That's why it looks weird. Okay. Um, too much. 
Too much isolation, too much chaos, too much of the world spinning and people crying and the crazed laughter that comes with knowing nothing and know everything. Too much to do, so busy that you can't find the time to look down at the sidewalk and see a ladybug and count 10 spots and feel lucky because that means you get 10 wishes. Too much of me, the good and the bad and the why. Too much spinning inside your own mind, driving you to feel like a single blade of grass and hundreds of acres of pasture. And yet when a massive truck goes by, you are the only one that gets crushed. Too much pressure, pressure on the brain to be smart and pressure on the heart to be loved and pressure on the arteries from saturated fat buildups. Too much structure and too much freedom leading to the question, do I be me or do I be the me you want me to be? Too much argument over right and wrong, battles of frustration carried out over country borders and the walls of a two bedroom single family home. Too much wandering, not for the sake of curiosity, but rather to run and hide and never face that which makes us want to burrow beneath the covers of our beds and never resurface. Too much being explicit when it should be illicit and not enough of the implicit being actively acknowledged. Too much fear, fear of the traumatic and of serial killers and of not fitting into a pair of size double zero jeans. Too much competition in a world that needs not winners or losers, but friends. Too much of wishing for rain, but screaming at the thunderstorm. Too much dwelling on the memories of the good old days and the mistakes of the past, longing to retrieve the lost minutes that have already become dust. Too much and not enough. Lexi, that, that first, uh, the first poem you read, Lucky, that was really amazing. I think thousands and thousands of poets have tried to take cliches and turn them into, some, to revivify and resuscitate them. But you uh, created a whole poem with 25 lines of cliches. It's an amazing <laughs> effort, really. It's very conscious, uh, clearly. Amazing. All right. Um, no, I, I I meant that you know when I said that it's full of cliche. I mean, okay. All right. Okay. All right. Um, the next poem is by Sania Laka, a student of Miss Sanders' self at Mount Madonna School. Uh, her poem is called My Mission, a Villanelle, and it's on page 46. Let's see, it looks like it's about right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. My Mission, a Villanelle. Can you hear me? Okay. The advice you have given, the memories that were made, continuing it will be my mission. I loved your clever intuition, and I will never trade the advice you have given. Your cooking in the kitchen is something I have always craved. Continuing it will be my mission. Visiting you was a tradition, and I will make sure I have saved the advice you have given. Family first was your ambition, and I will never put it into the shade. Continuing it will be my mission. In the family, you hold a big position, and no one will degrade the advice you've given. Continuing it will be my mission. A villanelle. Yeah. We don't get a lot of poems in traditional forms uh, these days. If you're interested in a, in a, a book that will give you uh, lots and lots of forms, Pick up The Book of Forms by Louis Turco. He was my first poetry teacher. And The Book of Forms has been uh, printed over and over again. I think there are over 200 different forms there that uh, you could easily access. The Book of Forms by Louis Turco. Uh, where are we? All right. Brianna Lohman is a student of Ms. Rogers at Harbor High School, and her poem is called Peace. It's on page 47. Welcome. 
looks okay. Is that right? Okay. Peace. Peace. The world is still quiet. Silent but for the breathing mists. An endless sea of untamed beauty. Wild and free. In the liquid glow of dawn, a frosted sea of fog, beginning to fall away to sunlight. As the timeless stars fade and a new dawn ignites, love in our hearts for this newborn world. As we watch, we are free. Our worries dance away. Time has lost its chains because we are now brave, ready to meet today, lost in the eye of the world, in a moment that lasts eternity, yet but an instant. Stretching on in memory, this is our own infinity. Farthest past the distant stars, closer than your own heart, for in this moment, we have peace. Thank you, Brianna. The uh, okay. At Letley Morales is a student of Mrs. Silver at Aptos High. Her poem is Another Face in the Crowd. It's on page 49. Apparently, At Letley is not here. Are you here? You are not. Is there anyone who would like to read? Her poem. All right, we'll go on. Sierra Meyer is a student of Mrs. Rigby at Monte Vista Christian School. Her poem is entitled Tattoos and it's on page 50. Welcome, Sierra. Oh, there you are. Hello. Tattoos. They wouldn't let him speak. So he told his story through the ink on his skin. It was a lost language, a language few people bothered to learn. And when people looked at him, they read into the wrong things. He cried in the dark, begging them to see that the real patterns aren't formed by the black, but by the spaces between. Neato. That's an old one, isn't it? Neat old. <laughs> Good thing I'm not old. <laughs> All right. Um, the next poem is by Zachary Passmore, who is a student of Mrs. Darrow, of Ms. Darrow, at San Lorenzo Valley High School. And his poem is entitled, What is the Snowplow Doing? And it's on page 52. Zachary? Yeah. All right, can everybody hear me? What is the snow plow doing? I wonder if snow feels insulted when it gets pushed out of the way, like carrots on a toddler's plate. There it was, so clean and new, freshly fallen. Yet the snowplow came, and now the white has become dirty slush, not suitable for building snowmen. And when the frost breaks, the slush goes away, vanishes overnight. Look up and see the souls of, so the souls of snowmen flying to the sky, seeking colder days. <laughs> I, I don't know how the judges did it. There are so many fine poems here. My goodness. Deciding which is which is which. All right. Simone Pickens is a student of Mrs. Silver at Aptos High School. Her poem is What the Thunder Said, and it's on page 53. Simone. Um, what the thunder said. The first time I meet him, he is a young man, and I am still small, small enough to carry. He picks me up with ease and points to the sky. Listen to what the thunder says. The next time I meet him, he is aged and gray, 
and I am young, young and strong as mountains. He smiles with crinkled eyes, and I bend down to hear him, listen to what the thunder says. The last time I meet him, he is ageless, and I understand. He looks to the earth, and I tell him, listen to what the thunder says. He laughs loud and booming, like slow, dark clouds against the autumn sky. Thank you. Sierra Rogers uh, would be the next uh, uh, poet, a student of Ms. Darrow at San Lorenzo Valley High, and her poem would be entitled, is entitled, Body Non-Issues, but apparently Sierra is not here. Is there anyone who would care to read Sierra's poem? All right. Next, oh, Levi Santos apparently is not here either. Also a student of Mrs. Rogers at Harbor High School, and his poem is Enjoyment. It's on page 56. Levi, are you truly not here, Levi, Levi? I'll read Levi's poem. Right on. Tom McCoy, one of the organizers of this event. So Levi's poem is entitled Enjoyment. Opaque dust clouds block the sunlight. Over the empty lot where the children are playing soccer, they wander through as though, as if they are blindfolded. But they don't care. They have fun as they scream and cheer on their teammates. So thick you can feel it, smog from a passing tuk-tuk blurs the air. In front of a group of women selling their huipiles, but they don't care. They laugh joyfully amongst themselves. A family rides in the back of a pickup truck down the palm-lined road toward Itztapa. Wind tugs at their faces and bits of mud splatter up onto them, but they don't care. They are together, laughing, watching the sun hide behind the sugarcane fields. It may not be perfect. It may not even be decent for some people. But the people are happy here. And I am happy here. This is where I feel at home. This is Guatemala. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. All right, we have come to a poem by Molly Schrank. Did I pronounce that right, Molly? You're here, aren't you? I, is that right, Schrank? All right. Student of uh, Ms. Rogers at Harbor High School, and her, she has two poems, Monsters and Soldier, on pages 57 and 59. Here you go. Oh, uh, we probably need to put this down. And uh, I'm just going to read Soldiers. S soldier. For Veterans Day, I brought a rose to the grave of a soldier. A friend of mine, he fought in the Civil War for 16 years. For 16 years, he got up every day in a battlefield. The walk from home to school was a minefield. The quad at lunch was enemy territory. His own mind was a war-torn country. He was a soldier without a general, without a unit, without a cause. Each day he was fighting the dark parts of himself, and each day he grew wearier as the dark parts only got stronger. People didn't notice the way his once young face became a soldier's solemn stare. And even if they did, what could they say? None of them knew how long this war would last, how great the casualties would be. His soul became a grenade, the pin already pulled which he was tasked with holding. He knew it was only a matter of time before it bloomed to pieces, and yet he held on anyways. He held on for fear of the damage the shrapnel would cause, for those his lost soul would hurt. For his mother would cry at his funeral, and his father would shake his head, and his little sister would feel ashamed to be seen at the grave of her broken brother. For no matter how hard he fought, 
This war was all his own, and he knew there would be no military honors at his burial. He woke up every day and felt the soul-crushing weight of his belief he so firmly held that this war was all his own. You know, for most soldiers, the battle truly begins when they fire their first shot. For so many others, their first shot is how it ends. Oh my God. It was amazing. All right, the, uh, the next poet is Holden Smith, a student of Ms. Melissa Sanders Self at Mount Madonna School. She has two poems on page 60 and 61. He, he, he. he. what did I, let me get the tears out of my eyes. I'm sorry that last poem got to me. Sorry, Holden, where, I apologize, Holden. God, <laughs> I cry easily. Uh, Children of the Stars on page 60 and Unlikely Infinite on page 61. Holden. people of stardust will be reclaimed by the cosmos. The path that we took will be marked by that which we touched. Like the silvery mane of a comet, these things too will fade. But what of the raw powers of emotion? Will they still linger in the universe as undying subject forces, rebellious subjects against time's rule? These energies have neither beginning nor end. We are the conscious manifestations of the cosmos. Our love is the fiery passion of entangled stars. Vengeance, the nova of the wrong lover. Death, the inescapable abyss consuming that which loved. Sorrow, the empty expanses left behind. <laughs> Unlikely infinite. There are no glowing halls filled with our ancient kin, nor divinity to dine alongside in the heavens. When our hearts labor no more and our bodies are laid to rock, hollowed by time, thoughtless will be gone forever. To have taken a breath atop the world from the last pockets of virgin air, laughing, crying. To have embraced the night sky, reached out and touched the constellations. To have hoped against time that the things I have, so I have loved so recklessly, the sea and the mountains, all the people in between, would last forever. Yet, to have been is enough. So when the wind pushes me no further, and the vessel that is this human soul splinters into countless pieces, and my atoms are mine no longer. Do not despair, for I have lived. Unlikely as it was, I lived. Thank you, Holden. The uh, next poet is Ronnie Smith. And he is a student of Miss Darrow at San Lorenzo Valley High School. His poem is open. It's on page 62. Wait a minute. Is he not here? He is not here. Okay. The next poet. Is there anyone who would like to read his poem? The next poet is Amy Talamantes, is a student at uh, uh, Natural Bridges High School. Amy, you're here! Oh my God! Hallelujah! It's funny because I never read my poems in class, so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, uh, but I have a desire to change but I left my courage at my old address. 
The wind took my blessings. I have a full a floor full of scars and a ditch full of darkness. And I left the directions in a shopping cart. <laughs> I tried two or three times to find you, but couldn't. Uh, the, uh, the next poet is Sophie Widman, who is a student of Miss Darrow at San Lorenzo Valley High School. Is Miss Darrow here, by the way? No, she's my husband's birthday. Oh, okay. She's certainly had uh, a, a number of students, which is great. Uh, Sophie, come up and read Tried not tired, page 64. Tried, not tired. Hello, dyslexia? Yes, this is the girl who cannot pronounce the first letter of her name. She tries to say the S, but it comes out as a TH. Should we be worried? Is there an Ophie Widman in the room? <coughs> dyslexia, darling. This is the girl who just got glasses because she cannot read the words that are right in front of her. She just needs to find the words inside of the other words. It's as easy as that. Sound the words out. Go slow. Hi there, dyslexia. Sophie here. This is the girl who cannot take a test. Should we have her tested? <laughs> oh no, she gets good grades. She will be fine but she fails her tests. Who mixes up tired and tried? I am tired of being the one who tried to pass a test. Please don't stay too long. I don't want to be the old lady too afraid to even speak for fear of messing up once again. Golly, that was terrific. I know that the next person is not here. He emailed me and told me that he had to work tonight. So I will read his poems. He's got two of them. And uh, the first is called, Zach Weiner is uh, uh, currently at the Yes School. And uh, I knew him at the camp, and now I know him at the Yes School. And he has two poems. The first is called, Can't Afford It. Some people use their intelligence like currency to buy emotions. They drop big money on love, but only small change for empathy. There are days when I'm so mentally exhausted, I can't afford expensive emotions. I'm broke and all I'm left with is sadness. Sometimes it feels like even the luxury tax is beyond my pay grade and that I'll have to take out a second mortgage on sympathy. I can't afford to be broke. I don't want to move back in with fear. And here's Zach's second poem on page 66. It's called Dream Factory. There's a quiet town not far from here with a factory designated entirely for the manufacture and delivery of dreams. A flurry of soft lights washes over its windows and its rusty exterior. Its machines work fluidly transforming wisps of emotion and threads of desire into midnight movies. The dreams are pressed into small packages, wrapped neatly in brown paper, then placed gently into tiny trucks that whiz down unlit highways, carefully avoiding the tar-scummed grip of shadows and delivered to needy sleepers. And I believe that we have come to the last poem. And the poet is Cole Wyman, who I uh, also know.
Cole, come on up and read in everything and everyone. I'm really nervous. <laughs> it's okay. I'll get that out. Um, I have a dream that hate will die that people will look each other in the eye, that women can walk alone at night, and that will teach boys they can cry. I believe one day there will be peace from Detroit to the Middle East, that everyone will have enough to eat because enough of us refuse to feast. I hope we all get filled with love. I pray we learn how much is enough, that people and fish and birds and bugs can live as one as God made us. I dream of strength and courage born of pain, and of people dancing in the rain. That alcohol, meth, pills, and cocaine will lose the power to drive us insane. Maybe I'm asking way too much, or maybe I'm not dreaming big enough. But I don't see heaven as something up above. I see it in everything and everyone. Well, <laughs> well, <laughs> is it working? Yeah. Right. Well, my golly, uh, thank you, thank you so much for coming, and thanks to all of the wonderful poets. Uh, and do come back next year, please. Good night. <laughs>